just form a fucking wall. O'Neal deep in the post, lots of contact there. Oh, what a block by Wallace! What wow. a jump ball! Listings down four, 12-8, 7-38 to play the first one. First from Rodney, stuck into the rim! Countdown, baby, and a foul! Red Jackson has got it. Reggie inside for Andre, oh. and a dynamite dunk! Pistons fans, hello and welcome to another edition of the Palace of Pistons podcast. Brendan Johnson, Aaron Johnson, Ryan Pay, all here with you again this week. Boys, again, we keep cruising through August. The schedule is dropped. The Pistons making plays in free agency. We kind of said the big moves might not be done yet. Yeah. We'll get into yeah. that. Some guys maybe oh, going overseas. No. How we doing on this uh this beautiful August day here in the great state of Michigan. You know, the news that's that's surrounding the Pistons right now is so boring and so dull that, I mean, like, I, I didn't even know. Today's pod will be very interesting. I'm excited to see how we talk about this past week surrounding the Detroit Pistons. Yeah, boys, I'm doing good. Uh, I've got nothing to talk about with the Pistons in the opening statement, but I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. It's a good day. Was that a was that a soundbite from Michael Beasley's press conference? Oh, I'm doing all right. Yeah, happy I'm doing to all be right. here. <laughs> happy to be here. <laughs> the Pistons have announced that they signed uh, Michael Beasley to what a one year deal here in Detroit. Um, and you know we told you the big moves were not done yet. Uh, so Detroit making another splash in free agency, pairing up the top two picks of the 2008 draft: Derrick Rose, Michael Beasley, and. Oh my goodness, 2008 Brendan is losing his mind. Well, this was something really out of left field. And it's funny because it comes just days after the NBA announced that Beasley suspended for the first five games of the 2019-2020 season uh, after breaking their substance abuse policy, which means you don't get him for the first five games of the year. Now, everything that's been reported says that this is a camp battle, Beasley does not have a guaranteed roster spot. The deal is non-guaranteed. So it seems like the final spot on the roster is going to come down to either him or Christian Wood or if somehow maybe a guy like Jordan Bone really impresses, but the Pistons already have three point guards going into training camp. So it really seems like it's just down to Wood and Beasley for that final roster spot. It's setting up a training camp battle. Um, Beasley is a guy that really didn't do much last year with the Los Angeles Lakers. Only appeared in 25, 26 games. Shot a putrid 17% from the three-point line. Just didn't really make an impact on a team that needed more impactful players. Um, And he's a guy that is just kind of inconsistent. He had a decent season with the Knicks the year before that, but was just completely non-existent with the Lakers. Um, And that was, you know, before their trades at, at the trade deadline and after. He just never was able to really find his footing or make an impact on that team I don't really see how he's going to be able to do that with the Pistons either considering their log jam with guys that can play the four with Blake and Thon and Markeith and Sekou Beasley's kind of what he would be your fifth string power forward maybe your fourth string power forward so and then when you look at the other guy Christian Wood he's a four or five the guy you're going to hope is able to play five um So it'll be interesting. I'm not a huge fan of the BZ signing, just in retrospect. I don't love what he brings to this team, and I don't really think he fills a a position of need or a, a, I don't even know. He doesn't fit the need in general Mm -hmm. of of what the Pistons kind of need still. And that's why I'm just not all too high on this signing, unlike Michael Beasley's high probably right now. Wow. Oof. Dang. (laughs) But I won't lie to you, fellas. This one really threw me for a loop. When that when that Shams uh, update on Twitter, that notification came through, I was just like, what the hell? What is this? What, what is going on right now? The P.O.P. chat got bumping. I'm like, wait, it's yeah, like 11 P-O- o'clock the P-O-P at night. The P.O.P. chat was booming, dude. I was like, yeah. what's going on? I was like, on? it's 11.15. What is happening right now? And I was <laughs> yeah. like, Michael Beasley? I mean, <clears throat> Aaron, you pretty much covered it. It, it doesn't really move the needle. It's... What's really the fit here? I mean, you've got your log jammed at the four, and Christian Wood is like a backup five as well. I mean, so you wouldn't really necessarily want to get rid of him if he's doing mm-hmm. decently. I here's here's the thing. 
if Michael Beasley can come in and just have a decent training camp, that puts some pressure on Christian Wood. I think it might be good for you know him to have some competition to really have to prove something in camp. I'm, I'm not convinced that Michael Beasley is going to be on the Pistons roster going forward. I don't mind the idea, though, of, hey, Christian Wood, this spot is not guaranteed. Show us something. Also, maybe it's a, you know, what if we don't trust Thon as backup center? What if, hypothetically, the Pistons move Dre at the deadline? You know, and Christian Wood has to come in and play significant minutes, maybe as a backup center. Maybe this is an opportunity to really see, under some competition, what Christian Wood's able to do. It just puts a little pressure on him to find out what you got. Yeah, it's going to put some pressure on him because Beasley's coming into this training camp with the intention of making the team. He turned down a $2.6 million deal to go play in China just so he could go to camp with Detroit and fight for a spot. So it's not just going to be some easy thing to win for Christian Wood. Now, again, I just don't see the fit from Detroit's point of view, but if Beasley goes out and Wood struggles and Beasley does all right, then, it might, you know, Wood could find himself in some hot water. I think it's Wood's spot to lose. If I had to make a prediction right now, I think Wood is the favorite, but Camp is going to decide it. It's not like either of those guys are proven contributors right now. Wood has really good numbers in the G League, and Beasley was is an inconsistent scorer, an inconsistent shooter, but when he's on, he's a nice bench piece. So it, it, it comes down to whoever has the better training camp, in my opinion, despite what I believe is the best fit for the team, and we'll go from there. I mean, I, I like where Michael Beasley's head's at and the fact that he turned down a guaranteed contract for a non-guaranteed contract because he wants to make an NBA roster. So maybe that puts a little desperation in his step. Um, but I'm with you. I, I think Christian Wood has to be considered the favorite right now and that this is being brought in as a don't get too comfortable, Christian Wood. We want to see you compete. We want to see you battle. But at the end of the day, you know, Michael Beasley's a, an NBA veteran. He's going to... He's going to put up a fight. Can I? Can we put something out there, too? I don't remember. I read it somewhere when Beasley signed. And somebody made the comment that Beasley coming to Detroit shows that, you know, even if he doesn't have a great spot in the NBA right now, a notable guy, a notable player would be willing to sign in Detroit. And, and I just want to make sure that we pipe that down real quick. Because Michael Beasley who had the option of fighting for camp in Detroit or playing overseas, and that's it, does not prove anything. Michael Beasley, it, 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 it just stop. Yeah, that's just stop. That's I saw insult. it, and I wanted to make sure I put that out there. Do not put Detroit in that category of, well, because a washed-up, non-guaranteed deal, Michael Beasley's coming. Oh, that's just a sign that people will come to Detroit in the future. Quiet I mean, if, if that it were, down. If it were 2011, sure. Yeah. Maybe that would add a little notoriety. But uh, it's 2019. Yeah. I mean, we're, one, we're talking about a guy fighting for a fringe spot. He is a fringe NBA player. We're also talking about a guy that, yeah, he was a number two pick, but he was never an all-star. His, his award is being on the all-rookie team in, in his rookie season. After that, there's really nothing. He's had some decent seasons. I mean, his best years when he averaged 19 points and six rebounds. Other than that, he doesn't really jump off the page to you. It's not like he had some historic career, and this is a former five-time All-Star. This is a former MVP caliber player back in his prime. Hey, we have the number one pick from 08. Yeah. He was an MVP caliber. Don't get me started on him. The haters will come back out. I'll have to defend myself again. Let's stick to the number two pick. We're talking about a guy that's 30, is on the fringe of an NBA roster, and never really had a ton of success in the NBA. So saying that this is some like free agency coup and we're getting big names to come to Detroit, that's just foolish. It's downright foolish, and I cannot believe that's a narrative that someone would have the audacity to spread. Tell us how you really feel, Aaron. Jesus. You know what? No more nonsense. No more no nonsense. No more nonsense. Can we clip that? Clip that? Can we get our guys in or the are back we, are to Are we in a Twitch that, stream please? right now? Did I just make a nice clip snipe that. in Fortnite? 
Oh yeah, hey, clip that, bro. Clip that. Facebook highlight it. Like, no more nonsense. I, I Aaron, listen. Over the course of this podcast, Ryan, we have seen Aaron grow and go through a variety of stages, from Stanley fanboy to, um, you know, I I don't know, just being a slappy. To oh, finally get the hell a out slap, of an here. absolute slap. Oh get my out god! Out of here, no, shut you. up! You know the maturity. Slap. The maturity level has maybe risen a touch. Yes, just a little bit. An absolute slap to. Uh, wow. Just, just some of a slap at right. this point. Oh right. my gosh! All right. Well, who knows if this podcast will even get out now after this? Oh no! We this was a compliment to you. Okay, oh, embrace, <laughs> embrace the fact. That, you know, even through the beginning of this pod, you were about three years behind in your Pistons maturity level. But you have skyrocketed. It, it was a compliment presented <laughs> as an insult. <laughs> Brendan watched 10 games this year and now feels dignified to talk about the Pistons. That is so as an unfair. That is not true. He didn't watch 10. He watched 12, okay? <laughs> yeah. And then he caught the Twitter highlights hey, for throughout the pod. And then he watched, caught the Twitter highlights. Hey, don't hate on the Baker's dozen 13. Jeez. Gosh. Brendan feels all dignified to lead a Pistons podcast because he catches a game twice a month. I mean, my goodness. Listen, that is that is not fair because it is not that sparse. Brendan but still sorry. thinks Zaza is start. Brendan, Brendan still thinks Zaza could start for this team. Oof. You guys remember that? Oof. I no, think Zaza I can hold it down no. for the season. I, hold, 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 hold on. That is so... So inaccurate. See, it's false. What you're saying is 100 percent fake. God, news. He got dragged. For it's 100 percent dragged. Right. I thought. So. I thought the podcast was done after that. <laughs> Listen, day. I said you could bring Zaza back as a veteran presence. No, in your no last he's not talking sir, about that. He's not talking about sir. That. Or when what? We're talking, when about we're, talking about? we're talking about Thanksgiving when we were talking about Beal to Detroit. God, we've been talking about. Beale we've been talking about Beal to Detroit since he was a rookie. Probably when yeah, this like, podcast when Beal when gets traded created. somewhere else. We are all on suicide watch. Just so I everybody know. When knows. Beal gets traded somewhere else, we'll still be talking about Beal. Still be Detroit. talking about Beal coming to Detroit. Yeah. We just got to wait the certain minimum of days, and then all of a sudden, like <laughs> once those gonna... sixty days are up, yeah. they're throwing out there. They're gonna throw Kennard out there. This is like two K, bro. Just as soon as the sixty days are up and he's eligible, he's getting traded. To Detroit. Back to the point of your idiocy. He's talking about when we brought up the point about trading Drummond in, in a package oh, for Beal. Okay, yeah. And I said I think if that happened, you. Could buy time with Zaza for what five to ten games starting uh, until you figured out a contingent plan, and you put out that you thought he could hold it down for the rest of the year. Uh, I I did say if he, pro- yeah, but if you couldn't have found somebody else, depending where you had to go, I'll stand by that. You oh, that's tough. Oh my god, I'll stand by that. I'll stand by that. That's the end of Pistons. Not the end of the I'll podcast. I'll stand by that. You get Brad- that's the end of po- Bradley. Of and, honestly, Bradley and Blake, I will go out there and play center. Run from free throw line oh, to the block no. on just the defensive side of the floor. And guess what? Oh, It'll be okay. Goodness. You have Blake and Bill on the same line. I just hope that's sarcastic. <laughs> I really hope that was sarcastic because you deservedly so, Aaron, would get dragged hey, for that. All I'm going to say is league clip. Hey, it's coming, Man, it's coming next it, year. Is Don't that worry. where we're at in the uh, off season right now? That we're just pointing out old, bad takes? We just got to do that for one whole podcast. Who are we? Old takes exposed? Freezing cold takes? Jeez. I love that guy. But what are we? Is that what we are now? I I don't know. Except we're just calling each other out? Gosh. I mean, I know I've had a million bad takes, but none of them come to mind for me. How was this? Oh, Beasley. That's who we're... How did we get here? Michael Beasley's a piston. I I guarantee contract. Yeah, we'll see how long that lasts. Okay, here's a question for Aaron. Which signing do you like less of the 2008 top two picks to Detroit? Derrick Rose or Michael Beasley? Don't lie. God. Don't lie. Okay. Do not lie. In all reality, I could I could make a case for either. Because Rose's is a two-year deal worth a lot more money. But I, I, I'm more inclined to say Beasley because I'm worried he might actually make the roster. Liar. No, I'm, Liar. I'm serious. I, if Beasley makes the roster, I will be severely disappointed because this team will have a major issue at the center spot because there is still a very much large part of me that is worried that Thon Maker may not be able to cut it as a center and then you don't have another center unless Markeith Morris really can do it for a full season or whatever. Saza? And, and he had a lot of injury issues. 
Jeez. We're, we're really you putting, trying to disband the podcast? <laughs> we're really putting a lot of stock and hope in Christian Wood. Yes, we, we are. We really are. And, and for me personally, I'm okay with that because I like Wood a lot. Wow, can we clip that? Clip that can one. Can we clip that one? <laughs> oh, what do we have on this? Somebody clip that. Wrap uh, her up. Palace of Pistons. Wrap her up. But the 1440 mark, just I like Wood a lot. Uh, Aaron Johnson. <laughs> I like Christian Wood more than I like Michael Beasley. <laughs> And I'm I'm just worried that the wrong decision will be made. It's the fact that there's a lot of it seems like there's a lot of potential there with Christian Wood. It seemed like I know it was a small sample size last year at the a end of the year. A lot of potential that would just a small a sample size. A lot of potential in Christian Wood. <laughs> um in a small sample size in what, eight or nine games or whatever it was last year, but he was putting up that seventeen and nine at the NBA level. And I mean the G League I, I get the G League's Nowhere near the NBA, but what was he, 26 and 13 or whatever it was? Yeah, gaudy numbers. Gaudy numbers. So, I mean, and he's young, so there's that hope of potential. So, if he can't beat out a veteran who's really on his final legs, who's a fringe NBA player, that's very worrisome. But in short, Rose is better than Beasley. I like the Rose signing more than I like the Beasley signing. I would love to put a lie detector test on this guy because I'm telling you, like he just doesn't want the Twitter mentions. Yes, seriously, he does not want that smoke. That's it. He does not want that smoke. I'm, I'm just saying. I, I do feel that way. I, I like Rose, the Rose signing more than I like the Beasley signing. I just now, what do you like I'm, more, the Rose signing or Wood? Just I like Wood. Just that blanket. You're really, you're really trying to do the pot in this week. <laughs> this is, this is in how, this is treason. This is sabotage, and I won't stand for it. No nonsense. No nonsense. <laughs> no nonsense. Ask okay. me how many voluntarily times you just stand, anyways. Okay. Next, next topic. This is just. <laughs> I can't believe we. Uh, I, is anyone still there? I probably not. Um, I mean, really, probably not. I still can't believe we got almost, what, 17 minutes out of Michael Beasley. I know. Do I got to change the topic? Do I got to do your job? Uh, no. Then then do your job. All right, so, yeah, the Pistons, their, their schedule drop for the 2019-2020 season. No nonsense. You As the rest mouth. of the NBA schedule done. In. Ow. I just chopped them right Ow. in the neck. Yeah, Pistons, new schedule. They come out this year. Ryan, I'd like to know your initial reaction as you see Detroit's schedule. Kind of a big stand in March, too, where they bring in some Western Conference powerhouses. But um, overall, I, I don't know if I expect much difference from last year in terms of overall record. Just off a blanket look at the schedule, even though it's kind of hard to judge this early on. I mean, for me, breaking down the schedule is... I don't know. It's, it's arbitrary. arbitrary. Yeah. It's arbitrary to me. I mean, yeah, that stretch in uh, March, that is, that's tough. Like, that's that's a stretch, without a doubt. But, I mean, it's really arbitrary to break down the schedule to me. But Honestly. Come on, you're telling me you're not just pumped up for a Thursday night home opener against the Atlanta Hawks? That's just not, you know, it's, getting the juices guys, going for you? Guys, it's... It's not the NFL where there's only 16 games and location of games matters and who you play actually matters. In the NBA, there's 82 games. They're all indoors. You play everyone a certain amount of times. Yeah, there can be some rough stretches. And sure, the Pistons have, what, 13 back-to-backs and they kick the season off on a back-to-back, if I remember correctly. And that's terrible. Yep, Wednesday, Thursday. Especially when, like, the week at... The league average for back to backs is like what twelve or something. So the Pistons have one more, which sucks. Um, and that's tough considering you got guys like Blake Griffin and Derrick Rose and Reggie Jackson who's had his injury problems. So that's kind of a bitch. But I mean, the rest of it really breaking it down. I mean, it's kind of arbitrary to me. It doesn't. Sure, the schedule got released, but it didn't really move the needle for me. Maybe I'm alone on that. But no, I mean, I used to get a lot more excited about it than I do nowadays. They're gonna have they're they're gonna play forty one games at home or forty games this year because one of their home games is in Mexico. Yep. And they're gonna yep. play forty one games on the road. I will say March is going to be very tough. For yes. Them. That is a very tough month, and I'm worried about it. One other thing, real quick, because I agree with the March thing, and we need to break that down a little. But uh, seeing the Pacers, what three times? Huge. How how early is it? It's like three times before. 
the new year. Yeah, is it, it's like three times before the new year. Oh, so there's no victory all the It's more than that. Or is, or is, it, it, is it three is times it in like the first month and a half and then literally, all four by the new year? It's yeah. three times. It's it's So it's October 23rd, October 28th, and November 8th. And then, and then and then one more in December, and then one and more December, December 6th. So you're yeah. not even seeing Victor Ol- Oladipo most likely. And that's that's big time. Oh, yeah. That really helps. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no excuse. There's no excuse. There's no excuse not the, to first off, minimum split. To see them three times in the first month of the season when they have to, one, deal without Oladipo <laughs> and build chemistry with Brogdon starting and TJ Warren and all the different guys that they had to bring in. There's just no excuse to not beat them every single time. Good teams have to capitalize mm-hmm. on their injured prey. They the Pistons have to pounce on that. As long as they're healthy and as long as they're at at least close to full strength and it's not like they're missing Blake Griffin or anything, no excuses. They got to make sure that they pounce on that and they handle the Pacers, but for me, the the problem is going to be the March schedule. And at the end of the day, if the Pistons are good enough and if they're talented enough, then they get through it. Because if you're good enough, you can handle playing other good teams. And the NBA is just a little bit more balanced this year with their distribution of stars and all-stars and higher-level players. So there's just more at least average to equal teams at the Pistons level or better. So if they are good enough, then they'll be able to at least hold their own or be in a good enough position in March to where it's not the end of the world. You guys, I've you know how I feel about the Eastern Conference this year. I just don't think it's some gauntlet dominated by upper teams in the in the conference, even if it's a weaker conference. I don't think it's that 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 difficult of a conference this year. I mean, sure, Philly is going to be good. Boston will be fine. But there's no reason but not to compete. There's no reason not to compete. And you you obviously play the vast majority of your games against the Eastern Conference. So that stretch in March, yes, it's brutal, but that shouldn't define this season. It because can't. It can't yeah. define what's, this season. What's concerning is if Detroit's like a middle of the road, slightly better. And they go into this, they go into this, you know, stretch in March towards like maybe they're three games, four games over five hundred, and it's like, oh crap, you know, and and all of a sudden you, you hit a rough patch, you lose two, three, four games in a row. Does that change anything? Does that change your momentum? Does that change mindset? Does that change the fan base? Does that kill your season? I think at the end of the day, it just comes back to good teams. Learn how to survive. And is this team, after the season that they had last year, does Blake Griffin and Andre Drummond and the rest of the group, do they have that maturity? Do they have that um, chemistry? Do they have that talent to where they know that they can overcome that, even if they do struggle from the, in the beginning? Do you expect the Pistons to be a good team this year? What do you consider a good team, and what do you expect them? To, do you expect them to be that? I expect them to be a good team, yes. So what makes what's a good team in your mind? I think you gotta make the playoffs. So a good team makes the playoffs? That's what you're okay. Yeah. For good is a relative term in my opinion. It's, it is. And that's yeah. why I'm asking and what you define as good. For me, in this Eastern Conference, good would be at least fifth place. Yeah. I agree. I don't think good is just making the playoffs. I think good is those in the second round and beyond in the playoffs, especially in the Eastern yes. Conference. Um, I think at a bare which minimum, which again is then your your four teams that move on. Because um, I think a bare minimum is getting fifth place. I think you're a de- you're a decent team, obviously, if you make the playoffs. You're yeah, decent. You can be decent. That's fine. But I think fifth and above. Obviously, there's tiers to how good you are. Sure. But I think that's good in this Eastern Conference. Yes. That's Agreed. a good team. Like last year, the Pistons were decent. I guess relative. Like, relative. Exactly. They were decent. And they made the playoffs and. You know, it's they had just Blake like, Griffin and had a great yes. year and whatever, and they won some big games against, like, Toronto and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, you, you don't go out and still win several games versus Toronto. You don't have the big win they had versus Philly, um, you know, whatever that was, like November, December, uh, where I think what, Blake off for 50, whatnot. You know, you don't have those kind of games. If you're not at least decent, but... But the, Detroit but has to take thing. a big step, though, I think, to fifth, be good. Fifth place in this year's Eastern Conference would be considered good, but this year's fifth place team 
you know, in the Western, in the Eastern Conference year, like compared to a Western Conference team or a Western Conference team this year, would not be a very good team. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm saying it's all relative. But for the Pistons to be considered a good team in the Eastern Conference Finals this year, I would say about fifth place and up. Really banking on winning a playoff series. Yeah. Like, that would be... Even I would competing de- in a playoff series, yeah. you know? And also, we qu- real quick, I'm not saying you questioned it, but we kind of questioned if there's leadership going to be... Like, if, if a rough patch happened. And I'm fully on board with how much of a leader Blake Griffin is. I don't think leadership's the issue. Yeah. I'm, that's the one thing I'm not worried about. Well, I mean, even though last year, you know, I mean, to me, it's like, how much better will Detroit be... And I don't think leadership issue was a problem. I don't think it was a leadership issue last year that watched Detroit go from a potential six seed to fall to the eight seed. Yeah, I don't it think was, it was a leadership well, issue. Blake Griffin getting hurt at the worst point in time for them hurt. Well, but leadership and, and that is also beyond falls. on the floor, though. I, I think leadership encompasses on and off the floor. And and I would say, I mean, not, Blake didn't become less of a leader not being on the floor. No, leadership you wasn't just the lost, issue. His, you lost his leadership level of play. wasn't the issue. It was Blake getting hurt at the wrong time, and the team not being able to, without Blake Griffin, handle teams that they still should have been able to handle. Right. The thing is, you know, you wonder. I mean, every every team's going to have injuries. And you just really wonder where it's going to hurt Detroit this year. Is it going to be Blake down the stretch? Is it going to be something like an unfortunate Reggie injury, one of your bigger names? Or is it just going to be your depth? You know, And are you going to lose one or two guys from your second unit that I mean, how many of games a is Derrick Rose going to miss? That's a fair question. I, I Again, I'm very hopeful that Derrick's going to be well, okay. You, you kind of got to pencil him in. I don't think it's 25, a question. Games. I think it's a statement. He's going to miss 20 games, 25 games. Yeah. I think that's... Not it, in question. It, it I think sucks. that's just a fact. It sucks. I hope not. You kind of got to pencil that in. It, it's it's not unfair to like make that a preseason expectation and be hopeful that it's not that. But bad. that's where the depth upgrades they've made come in. Right. Like a lot of these betting websites and over unders and all that are basing off of kind of last year's results and how awful this team was when they had to go to their third string. Right. The depth upgrades are there. Yes. Agreed. Big time. That's why if Derrick Rose does miss 20 games, like, yes, it sucks and it hurts the team, but it's not as miserable and as big of a problem as it would have been last year. Right. Because you have more options. You They literally lost games because Jose Calderon was on the court. Literally. that His statistical breakdown, right. his analytics, prove it. Tim Frazier or Bruce Brown, whoever it is, I think will be more serviceable and better – than a guy like Jose Calderon would be. So that's why I'm not... Like, it It worries me, but it's not like I would lose sleep over if I was the Pistons. Mm-hmm. You, about depth issues. Yeah. You, you have to anticipate and be ready for Rose missing a large chunk of time. You have to prepare to lose Blake for 10 games, whether you're resting him or he does hit a minor injury. And you should do that, though. Blake should not play... To me, Blake should not play more than 68 regular season games. I was about to say, Blake's line 68 to 70. Se- I mean, 70 is like the very most. Yeah. You, you, you still got to win. You still got to, but you know what? But you have to, you have, you have to, to preserve be, him too. You have to be smart and give him rest days. You know, not like That's every back like, to If back, you but, have a back to back against Golden State or, or some other juggernaut out west, rest Blake. Right. Be a little bit smarter about that. We this can't year. have a situation like. I still look back at last year's game versus Oklahoma City when everybody's like, oh, this is a must-win game for Detroit. And Blake goes out hobbled, and he has a great night still. like plays really well through the injury, but Detroit loses. Mm -hmm. And then he couldn't play against, what was it, Memphis or or Cleveland? Or or Cleveland, and they lose the game. Yes. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot have that. Right. But you have to anticipate Rose missing time, Blake missing some games, Markeith Morris missing some games. And, and and who knows? Tony Snell missed some time last year as well. So, and and then there could be a Reggie injury, which you know you hope doesn't happen. And Luke has had his and injury how, who knows? issues. How long is Reggie going to be in Detroit? I mean, we talked about we that talked last, about week. last week, right? I mean, could Reggie be gone mid November? You know, does he make it all the way to the deadline? Yeah. How early will Detroit be shopping? Are they shopping him right now? And I'm and, and I don't mean like loosely, like of course everybody listens to phone calls. I mean like. How seriously are they actually shopping him right now? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I, I wouldn't surprise me if they're they're actively doing it, but I don't know. I mean, 
I don't know. I, I don't know if the team's going to want him right now. If I'm Dwayne Casey and in Mike and the rest of the coaching staff, at this point, the only positive about the schedule coming out, really, is I would be there planning rest days for Blake, figuring rest time for Reggie. I mean, yeah, Reggie and Derrick Rose, figuring those things out right now, mm-hmm. building in a plan right, right now so you can have a plan going into the season. So Blake knows, hey, I'm going to give it my all, like, for this stretch because I know I've got this rest day and then we've got two days. Like, I know I've got yeah, these times. Blake, right. Blake should know, like, a week or two in advance of when he's going to rest. Sure. So he knows for the next two, three games, okay. I, I'd honestly plan out the first half of the season right now. Absolutely. Why not? It's a plan. You don't... And then you know, then you can see where you're at at that point in the season, and then you can go from there with how we need to plan this out. Right. For the playoffs. Also, and I know Drummond's the kind of guy that – doesn't miss time. We know what that that in the middle of the season that did from when he got that week or so off after you know with his head injury. You know how much does that? How no, much do you entertain the idea I, of maybe once or twice resting him for a game? I get he's still a young guy at twenty six. He's still got some time. It's it's proven. I would give him some time off. Absolutely. Not I mean not a time. I mean it's not like Drake can only play seventy games this year, but. He should get a couple built-in games where he does take a little time. Right. Especially, like, around Christmas. You know, like you have a game, I think, on December 23rd. So I think you play, like, a back-to-back. You get a day off. You play on, like, the 23rd, and then you're off till the 26th. I think you play Philly. I don't know. Depending on where you're at, to me, it's one of those... Everybody knows that people throw games in the NBA. I'm Maybe that's very, very much for that. Like throw that Philly game. Who cares? Rest. It's Blake a fifty fifty. Uh, with Philly being as good as they are, that is not like a surefire win if you're at full strength. So rest Dre and Blake. Who cares? Go out, play some different guys. Give guys a little bit of rest, and then you come back on the twenty sixth, and you get down the twenty second, the twenty third, the twenty fourth, the twenty fifth. A nice four day rest off right there in the middle. Not a bad deal. Maybe even maybe even say the twenty sixth too, and then they don't play till the twenty eighth. Now you're getting like a six day rest. You I'm know? very much for resting guys at the same time. I really like that philosophy, and I know that that kind of originated with Greg Popovich when he when it was with was Tim Duncan and Manu Ginobili and Tony Parker, and he would do that, and he caught flack for that. But at the same time, the Pistons, I don't know if they're a talented enough team to right. survive. You know. Spreading Blake it out. out. Yeah, yeah, spreading, spreading it, it out. out. If they spread it out, are they talented enough? You don't, yeah, you don't just have take enough. your lump. Just yeah. take your couple it's lumps. It's going to happen. So you're, right. you're back-to-back against Golden State. You're back-to-back against Philadelphia. Whatever. Just rest them both at the same time. Yeah, right. Just that's take where your you, L. Don't That's it where you and, get Sekou some minutes. Yes. And, and you get some of your younger guys. And you try out some different lineups and whatnot. And you know what? Other teams do it. I, that's my that's my thought process on that. But we can move on. I, I, I no, I agree. I agree a hundred percent. You know, we kind of look at just some other things going on. We're talking about maybe some some lineups and depth and whatever. Uh, and Davidis Servitas is going back overseas to play another year. No surprise there, uh, as he will not be on the Pistons roster this season. Makes sense, though. Another year to develop overseas was expected, at least, I mean, literally from draft day on. So, uh, to no surprise, but Servetus will be overseas for at least one more season. Yeah, and it was necessary. I mean, he came into Summer League, and just from the moment he stepped on the court, it was very obvious that he didn't have an NBA ready body. He didn't have an NBA ready game, uh, you know. I mean, the first play he got trucked to the off the court, pretty much. On a, on, a, on a, I don't even know if he was on defense or offense, but he got trucked off the court, uh, and he didn't really impress in summer league. It's not like he played a heavy dosage of minutes, shot the ball extremely well, did anything that to really stand out. And on that front, it just makes sense that he goes overseas. It makes sense that he spends another season developing his body and developing his game. But how worried are you about that? Are, are you worried that Servetus has to go back overseas after his summer league? And there's just really not been a lot of talk about him after the Pistons spent so much to get him. Honestly, not very worried. When they took him, it was he needs time to develop. 
He's not there physically. And it showed. He came and played <clears throat> Summer League, and he wasn't ready physically. Right. I mean, he can shoot. You can see there's talent there. If It would be one thing if, oh, his shot's broken. The talent's really like He just needs to mature physically and develop. So, fine. He goes over for a year to Europe, and then he comes here and plays a year in the G League. So be it. It's like you don't have a spot for him anyway. You don't have it's, a spot for him. It's not like, though. man, we could really use him. And it's not like he's 23 in this draft, and it's like, bro, come on. Yeah, right. He's 19. Right. Like, he's still developing. He's got it's three, fine. three years before we even He need to really see him. does. He has three years before he hit that 22 mark, 23 mark, where you really need to be hitting that stride where we would need him. Right. So, uh, it doesn't worry me that much. Yeah, Fair not enough. Not, not a big concern. Yeah, I mean, eh. I mean, I can understand if it's you're a little concerned. I can see that. Um, but for me personally, I'm just not that worried. The guy just needs time to develop. Well, he drew some comparisons to Luke Kennard, but if you watch Tim Forkin's uh, video that went up on Palace of Pistons, you would know that Luke Kennard is significantly better. I, I thought Tim did a really good job of just breaking down. You know, Luke Kennard style play, how Detroit needs to use him. Uh, you, you look at some of the numbers, too, and how many shots he gets per game, how he needs to be getting closer to the you know, 13 shots a game, I think was the number that Tim used. Yeah. And the number of attempts he had compared to other elite shooters in the league to where if, if Luke's volume of shots went up, the math shows his numbers would average with some of the top shooters in the league. I think it's safe to say Tim's the Luke Kennard of the Palace of Pistons team. Young, hasn't gotten uh, you know, hasn't gotten a ton of shots up yet, a ton of video content up yet, but the people that have watched it know the talent he has. It was an excellent breakdown as always, wouldn't expect anything less from Tim. Uh and he laid it all out very well. Luke's a guy that I've been saying it all off season. He's got to have a bigger role next year. He's your best young piece. Show that he's your best young piece. Don't just kind of act like it. You got to show it. Luke's got to be getting more touches. He's got to be getting more plays called for him. He's got to be getting up more shots. That's on the Pistons. That's on Luke Kennard. Because what I saw in the playoffs was a very good player. But I didn't want to see that for a full season. Because that makes the Pistons a lot better. No, I mean, as we get cl- as the season was winding down and ended, and as we're getting closer to the season here, and as the summer is going on, I'm convincing myself more and more in my head that Luke Kennard is going to take on a much, much bigger role on this team offensively. Has to. He, not only he has to, they're going to. That is in the plan. It's not just us talking about, come on, it has to happen. I am positive that is in the plan. For this team going into training camp, this is how we're working it. This guy's getting up his shots. We gotta find him. I'm convinced. Like I've convinced myself that that's what's gonna happen. He is too good of a shooter, and he's a good playmaker, and he's young and athletic. There's too much talent there to let it not become a thing in the offense. I'd be very happy to walk out of the season saying Luke Kennard is the Pistons' third best player. I'd be very happy. Because right now, I don't know where he would rank. Right. I think he falls behind, you know, your, your obvious Blake and Andre, Reggie. And then, I don't know, is he your fourth best player? Or do you still consider Rose and Snell? Do you consider those kind of guys as greater players than him as an L? But for me personally, if we can walk out of the season and say, well, Luke Kennard did enough to show he's the third best or right there with Reggie as the third best player on the team, then it's been a successful year for him. Yeah, this is a big year for Luke. Um, he has to he has to find a way to fit in with that starting lineup. Has to. And yeah. and I'm 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 gonna tell you right now, even if it I'm really gonna be disappointed if Bruce Brown is starting over Luke Kennard. And and if I'm a betting man, I am betting that Bruce Brown is starting over Luke Kennard just to balance the lineups a little bit. And, but still, it's just there's something about Luke and taking that next step that he needs to be in the lineup. He needs to be on the floor at the beginning and at the end of games. As much as it's he needs to be the starter, it also needs to be the he shows he can play with Reggie, Blake, and Andre at the same time. Because there were 
times last year where they struggled together and Luke didn't necessarily fit in well. And that's a problem. Because if Luke is part of your future, as are Blake and Andre, then they have to work together. They have to mesh on the court. So as much as it's about starting for him and I you know how I believe he should be starting, it's also about I also believe he needs to be able to fit with the rest of your core. Yeah. It's it's one of those things where I don't want to see Luke just kind of get positioned as he's a good second unit guy. He's a good sixth man. You know, he's a good scorer off the bench. He can be more than that. And if he's positioned and labeled as that early in his career, I don't want it to be something where, well, that's where he's stuck in. No, we don't want to put that ceiling on him because that's not his ceiling. Like, he can be a very good NBA starter. I'm not talking Hall of Fame or any of that nonsense, but he can be a high-level starter in this league and a, and a good-level scorer as well. And shooter, clearly shooter. So, yes, I agree with you. I'd love to see him in the starting lineup. But really, I think there's going to be lineup balance with Dwayne Casey. So, if I were a betting man, I would bet with you, Brendan. Because I think Bruce Brown's going to be the starter. Just going to balance the lineups better, despite that need. Unless they're Luke. really able to work, you know, those four together. Luke, Reggie, Blake, right. Andre. Because like, like, we like we've said a million times throughout our time doing this podcast, and Aaron just brought up, the four of them together didn't really mesh all that great last year. Yep. If they can iron out those details in training camp, then it's a different story. Maybe, but, we, don't, maybe we don't know and they've been up at Summit just running pickup games all summer together to build that chemistry. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Okay. Them versus Hoodie Mello and his boys. <laughs> oh, jeez. I think that's... I think that just kind of has to end the podcast right I there. think so. Hoodie Mellow got to mention. Hoodie that's Mellow got to mention. Jeez. Well, before you go, I hope you didn't click out yet. Before you go... First and foremost, guys, check out the website, palaceofpistons.com, providing a lot of good content. Again, want to just shout out you know, our good crew of writers. They're doing a great job providing content on the daily. Check out our YouTube channel, which continues to grow, uh, led by Tim Forkin, putting out some really good quality content. We talked about the Luke Kennard video. Um, like. Rate, review, subscribe to the podcast. Check us out on Twitter at Palace of Pistons. We're on Facebook, Palace of Pistons. Instagram at Palace Pistons. You can find Aaron on Twitter at A Johnson NBA. Ryan at Ryan Pay. Myself at Media Brendan. Uh, I, I think I got the whole bit. Podbean, Stitcher, SoundCloud, iTunes, the whole slew of platforms that you can find the podcast on. Uh, you know, continue to like, continue to subscribe, share whatever you got to do. And uh, we're going to keep providing some good content through these days of August. And like we say each podcast, we are getting closer to preseason, which means we're getting closer to the return of Pistons basketball. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. We will see you next time here on the Palace of Pistons podcast. Pistons podcast.